We are live. Yes, we are. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi, and with me is uh, Armin Navabi. Armin, how are you? How are you doing today? I'm okay. I'm great. How are you? I'm, I'm really great, too. I've been, it's, it's really good. It's, it's good. Uh, the election's over. I've been sleeping better. I'm feeling better. I've been oh. like, especially sleeping better, like God during the Holocaust. You um, know, I okay, Ali. Are you serious? Okay, you know what? Oh, I'm no. not. Doing, I'm not doing good anymore. I'm. I was. I was having. I was in a, such a great mood, and then Ali just dropped right at the beginning. We didn't even pass the thirty seconds. You know, actually, he dropped it at. The, he brought. He dropped the big edge right exactly at the time that YouTube is the most sensitive about the first thirty seconds. So yeah. Okay, great. We run I didn't over. even catch that one. Yes. I know. It's, a, it's just a, I, 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 it was for the joke. I totally, totally forgot. Uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> we're now to obviously something a little bit more serious. So on this episode, I'll come, we have uh, a guest that Susanna referred to us, and I heard about her story, and I was uh, just really, really compelled. And I thought uh, I just had to, well, both of us, Armin and I, just had to have you on, Deborah. Um, so Deborah's with us today. Deborah was born into a Mennonite family, and she grew up in Canada. Uh, she went to Bible college after high school, uh, which ultimately led her to leave Christianity and become an atheist, as Bible college often does. Um, but uh, later on, she was recruited into the Islamic fundamentalist organization, Hizbut Tahrir. Hizbut Tahrir, I think many of you might know, is uh, what the organization that Majid Nawaz used to recruit for as well, uh, because you know before he came out and became who he is today. Um, so Hizbut Tahrir is an organization that aims to reestablish the Islamic Caliphate. Um, she was uh, buried. Her husband uh, was a member, uh, and at one point, uh, Deborah, I guess you'll tell us more about this. You were fully practicing hijab wearing, abaya wearing uh, Muslim, but today the way that you're seeing her, you can tell that things have changed. So Deborah, first of all, welcome to the show. It's an thank honor you. to have you here. And thank you yeah, for coming here. Thank you very much. Yay. Yeah. Okay, so some people, by the way, before some people already know Deborah and the people who already know Deborah in the live chat, they know how awesome she is. So a lot of we have a lot of people who are very excited that Deborah yeah, is here. I'm in yeah. the atheist public family. Yeah, that's great. So, Deborah, like, how? So, just tell us like a quick overview of the first part of your life. So, you you know, you were born in the a Christian family. And you grew up. How did that transition? How did you end up with Hizbut Tahrir? Oh well. Um, so yeah, I was born to a Mennonite uh, family. Um, my parents uh, grew up in Mexico in villages, so they did like the whole like no electricity and very segregated. Um, but they met and got married here in Canada and we just like, they lived in the city. They didn't want to raise their kids that way. So we, um, we were just religious, like by going to church and visiting relatives and we would go uh, spend time in Mexico in the summers with like the villages there. So we were exposed to it a lot. So um, I guess a lot of that fundamentalism was kind of ingrained in me. Like I, I was like against feminism as a as a young girl. I saw that, you know, that doesn't work with like Mennonite ways. Like the woman should, you know, be the wife and have the kids and be at home. Like my mom stayed home with us until we were all in like older and then she got like just part time jobs. So she was always home, like always, you know, raising us. So I just I was the only girl in my family. So I saw that as my role, basically. So um, I always went to church. Um, I was always the most religious in my family. So I actually found any local churches and joined like youth groups and all my friends were like the churchgoers. So I was always quite fundamental that way. And um, after high school, I decided to go to Bible college for a year. Um, well, I didn't mean to go for a year, but it ended up only being a year. And because that's now when I really saw how the Bible was <laughs> compiled when I took an Old Testament class. And uh, man, it was like this sinking feeling in my stomach. I remember it. It was just like I was so disappointed. Like it was just really like 
that's that's all that happened there. They just found a bunch of texts and decided which ones they wanted to just piece together. Like it wasn't, I don't know, it just seemed like it should have been in like a very divine magical process, but there was just so much that had been left out. And then all the things that you lose in translation, because I was learning a lot of Hebrew at the time. And I was just like, this is like not what I was believing in. So um, I, you know, descended into like an atheist type of life after that. And um, I met an atheist guy and we got married and we were married for a few years. Um, and it just didn't work out. We didn't have kids or anything. And that's when I was like more spiritual and kind of searching around for things. Like I was just looking and I had met my ex um, uh, during this time. And uh, he was like this, his book career activist, like he was doing, like they were participating in debates and lectures in the universities. And um, so it was very interesting because like this was now during uh, when Bush was being reelected and the Iraq war was you know, happening. And I was, you know, very liberal minded at the time. So I was like, against all that and like the whole 9-11 conspiracy thing was going around. So I was more starting to be like, oh, like there's like a whole nother side to the other half of the world that I didn't know. And I knew nothing about Islam. And so him coming forward and saying that Islam is an ideology, it's like a whole way of life. It's not just this religion. It, uh, it started just making sense with like, you know, the issues I had with Christianity, you know how they kind of solve those problems. Like in my head, it made a lot of sense. And um, so I just kind of decided to dive in and we got married <clears throat> and I converted to Islam like during that exact same time. So um, yeah, we uh, just, Full on, like I basically left my town and didn't tell anybody, and we just like basically. What's it when you converted to Islam? Was it the uh, was it Islam and his with Tahrir that was the primary um, driver for you, or was uh, your relationship with uh, the sky? Well, I mean, he. I mean, I, obviously, I was like interested in him, and I thought he like he was seemed just. Uh, he was just a lot more intelligent than the other guys that had been dating at the time and stuff. And the, just the activism and just this whole, like I was learning the history of the other side of the world now. And I was starting, things were starting to make sense from that point of view. And so it was like everything about it. Like, so I was like researching Islam on my own a bit and it's just all seemed so intriguing to me. And basically having like everything dictated to you. And um, I found comfort in like knowing like this is what the creator tells you what to do and you don't have to like make it up for yourself. And so you just kind of know what you're doing is right. So how to dress, how to eat, how to everything, right? So I just like fell into that. And with the hizab, um, it was like, I joined the group almost exactly at the same time because now I was in this group. Like all my friends were from them. We were just doing all the activities like right from the start. So I was learning how to pray while attending halakas <laughs> with all the his sisters. And I was like feeling like, wow, so I'm learning the right Islam like right away. So like I, I felt like, you know, fortunate, like I'm learning it better than all the other Muslims around kind of thing. Can you actually tell us a little bit about the difference because um, of Hezbo Tahrir or the Hezb, as you say it, um, with other average mainstream Muslims uh, or at, at least mainstream Muslims around where you, um, where you were? Yeah, I guess just that um, the Hezb just practices it like not a religion. It's like a full way of life. Like you conduct everything. Um, so we would be calling out other Muslims all the time uh, for for anything, like for participating in the government or uh, any of the, uh, I don't know, like 
if they're just not dressing right, like, you know, just going around to different lectures and trying to correct them. Like if there was any conferences, we would go to them and they stand up and debate the lecturers every time. We would go to like different, um, I don't know, like these Pakistani uh, events sometimes. And they were like, they invited the mayor to come to these and we would like be like, you know, this is wrong. And we would like stand up and try to correct everybody because like we're not supposed to be participating. But in participating in government, you're not supposed to be participating. Right. Or supporting right. it or anything. Yeah. Or supporting, supporting it. it. Why? You go on, sorry. No, go ahead. So, well, I'll, I'll actually add on to that. The I think the one distinction about Hizbut Tahrir, the way that they have been have avoided being uh, banned like other sort of fundamentalist Islamist groups, is uh, that they don't take the violent approach, right? So they tend to do political activities, proselytization, right? Uh, but they still want to establish Sharia law in Western countries. And they still want to establish a global Islamic caliphate. Yeah, um, yeah. But they and do it more by the, the appeal to me as well, because it was like we're we're bringing about the Islamic State, but in a nonviolent way. So it was like, mm -hmm. you know, we're not a threat. We're just bringing ideas and uh, correcting people, and um, basically, like we give lectures that would say like you know you're only practicing a third of islam because there's no state for us to implement the rest so basically we're all sinful until right. we can live in the state and implement all of islam or at least if we're not working towards it we're being sinful so but the like islam that they would implement if that state was theoretically achieved right um that they would implement would be would have those violent elements 100 uh, as yeah, in they're they like, yep, believe you in it, have, right? Yeah, you have to have that, but you can't implement that part of the state until there is a state. So okay. yeah, like it adds a whole big thing, but it's just not. Yeah, very yeah. Muslim Brotherhood. I, like. Yeah. No, yeah. Did, well, okay, actually that's a very good uh, no, comment. They, can, 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 sorry. No, uh -huh. that's okay. So the difference between, so if we have like um, ISIS and then Hezbollah Tahrir and then Muslim Brotherhood, the difference is that, so the similarities between uh, ISIS and Hezbollah Tahrir is that they both want to bring the Islamic State. Um, the, the similarities between Hezbollah Tahrir and Muslim Brotherhood is that they both are nonviolent until, you know, they're in power or something like that. But the difference between Muslim Brotherhood and Hezbollah Tahrir is that Muslim Brotherhood is very much participating in governance right now. And Hezbollah Tahrir doesn't want to participate in governance right now. Like they're against the democratic process. The Muslim Brotherhood's entire ad agenda is to get them to come into power using the democratic process. Right. Do you agree that that's the difference between them? But, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Uh, they use uh, the system to like kind of infiltrate it, like so mm -hmm. saturate it. But right. um, the Hizb would say that's wrong and it won't ever work because uh, that's not the way the Prophet did it. And, the prophet and, did and they're right. Work. Exactly. I mean, so the, the, they are like, the state will only happen when we do exactly what the Prophet does. So like they, they have their own Sira and it's called the Islamic State. And it's, mm. it's like the Sira, but in that whole context on his exact method on how he spread the ideas get people together, the way they conduct their halakas and the way they educate people and the way they teach you how to think. And it, everything is based off his life and the, all the hadith on how he implemented the Islamic State, like letter to letter, like they are very adamant about that. I would very much like to see a debate between a Muslim Brotherhood um, person and a Hezbollah Tahrir person because I do not yeah. understand how could the Muslim Brotherhood person win because the first thing that the Hezbollah Tahrir person could say is that, listen, the election process, parliaments, presidents, these are European, yeah. these are ideas that came out of Western Europe during the Enlightenment era. How on earth could you even pretend that this is anything Islamic? Yeah. And I do not know how you would defend that. Like his Terrier person will win that argument yeah. outright. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, but but here's a, a, a danger. Like, I don't know, Deborah, if you know this, but if, uh, let me know if you think this is true. Because before ISIS, if non Muslims who were familiar with the idea of an Islamic state 
were familiar, were knew of and the idea of Islamic State because of Hezbollah Tahrir. Like I know a lot more people figured out like, oh, this Islamic State is a thing. This global cal caliphate is something that some Muslims want to bring back because of ISIS. Uh, but before that, if any non-Muslims have heard about that, and that goal was because of Hezbollah. Tahrir. They popularized it among non uh, for among non Muslims yeah, before ISIS. Like the word that they're constantly saying is Caliphate, Khilafah, Islamic State, everything. Do you think the Hezbollah Tahrir red pilled a whole bunch of people into the ISIS? Like, I wonder. Like it was I like, mean, it was like a what was it called? What was it? A gateway drug for like some people to go they from. Call, like, uh, in the UK, they call the Hizb uh, a conveyor belt to terror oh. people. So, so yeah, so yeah, so basically, what, the way it works, it's a gateway. Like some people suggest, I don't know how accurate this is, is that you're just an average Muslim minding your business, not doing like anything Islamic or just yep. doing the minimal, and then Hezbollah Tahrir introduces you to the idea of that we need to bring on the Islamic State yep. back. And then through peaceful means, and then you get so excited. Yes, Islamic State, we need to bring it back. And then at some point, you might be like, I don't think we could achieve that. Like, it's not, it doesn't seem like it's possible using the, the Hezbollah Tahrir method. And then you look into other groups that might be oh, interested in bringing it. Also, yeah. The way they culture you once you're in, it's, mm -hmm. it's very methodical. Like, it's so cult like, like the way they, they teach you. Like, so they, they like if they have these fired up youth that like could go that way they have right. a way of like just like no no no, no. and then like you, they culture you till you're like thinking exactly like them like i'm telling right. you they all have their way they speak that's why like when we're watching stuff with magic it's like yeah i can like you still see that way in him it was like really <laughs> you really it's okay so totally magic yeah. magic you see you you see you still see some hezbollah Tahrir in the way magic speaks like it's was... just in you. Explain, explain, elaborate. Just the way, what... like they Sorry. not like lay things out and, and explain things in like a systematic way, and how like they manipulate the things into saying, no, 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 it's just a discussion, and we're not having an argument, and that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> doing like, oh my god, it's sounding like. I, I may have missed it, but did we mention that uh, um, Majid Nawaz was involved in um, recruiting your husband to his Tahrir, right? Oh, yeah. This is back at the time when Majid was a member. So, so. he, yeah, while he was a member in uh, the UK, uh, he was actually Mazin's teacher. My, sorry, Rick. Mm -hmm. my ex's teacher. And um, he uh, was his, like, mas'ul, they call them. So they culture them. So you do your full, like, teachings with him and he became a member under him and he um up until he was imprisoned in egypt um and then i guess that's my so basically your life got screwed because of magic magic now what <laughs> no he, he could probably would have come across them too but uh so yeah. magina was basically recruited your husband into his batterier and you got recruited into his batterier because of your husband yeah. So technically, you became radicalized because of Majid Nawaz. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Although I never became a full member. I was just, uh, I, re I didn't want to become a full member because there's mm -hmm. so much responsibility on you. But I was like uh -huh. being taught under them and everything the whole time. So, so Deborah, when you were in, um, so you talked about some of your sort of beliefs um, at the time. You were talking about conspiracy theories about 9-11 and you know all this yeah. stuff so once you got into his but uh, i mean they do believe as in like the the, uh, the ideals that they have like once they do achieve this islamic state um they do have opinions about what should happen to apostates you know how women should be treated oh, 100%. Are, are, those, are those things that you believe so describe a little bit you know you wore the hijab you wore the burqa you did the whole thing yeah um and did yeah. you also believe these things how did you rationalize uh, these things in your because i mean it sounds like there's a grooming process i mean this you yeah, know when you're talking about culturing them it sounds like it's grooming and priming uh the mindset so yeah it's really uh teaching you how to think and how to react to everything 
like in an Islamic way. So when you're watching anything on TV or if you like are out in public, like how to process it as a Muslim and how to look at it. And everything is based off of like, you know, uh, your afterlife and how this is affecting like your Islam and how to behave in Islamic personality. So um, he like would sit me down and the way they like lecture you, I always say he always lectures you is just like sitting you down and explaining something to you over and over for as long as it takes until he sees that you can repeat it back and be fully understanding. So I was like a hundred percent convinced of the Quran that it was like a hundred percent God's words. So everything that the Hizb teaches about like Islam being an ideology and everything was like following the prophet's methods. I was a hundred percent convinced by it. And I felt extremely fortunate to be like guided to that. Like I was guided and I converted uh, or reverted and was got to get married and not make any mistakes with my Islam. So I was like, I had this, like, I felt honored. So I was like fully convinced by it. And so as, so as I was learning more and more about Islam, the longer you're in it, you're already fully convinced. So when I heard about the apostasy, that was like several months later, but it was like, well, whatever, like, I'm not going to leave, like, obviously. So it wasn't even, it didn't But even, do you think it's justified for people to be killed? I or? didn't, uh, I didn't like, because I, I think there had been a case in Iran that came, was in the news. And that's when, like, we were talking about it, like the his talk about it as well and saying, yeah, it is a legit law and it will be implemented. But so, but it's merciful because if you leave Islam, you don't just go kill them. You go and you bring them back and you try to convince them. And there's a process and, you know, you don't kill them until they like fully reject or whatever. So it was like this, like, you know, it's merciful. So we would probably like convince I was, them to go back. I was told that the stoning of gay people was also merciful in Islam. Because if you because die, be, no, because you, you paid the price and now you don't have to burn for it. Right. So right, the right? punishments, the Sharia punishments are like considered a punishment here that you will uh, spare you from in the afterlife or in right. the grave. But not that apostasy one, because if you're not a Muslim, you're going to go to hell anyways. Right. Unless you, yes. Uh, but they, yeah. Fair. Is that what? Hmm? That's not fair. All of the other punishments can like get you there. You can atone on earth and you don't have to go. I don't know control. if all of them. I think it's not just all partial. Them, yeah. Like it's, yeah. you know, it's not like it does carry over. To so the, the, the stoning of the gay person is for the sake of the gay person, apparently, because now you don't burn in hell. But the killing of the apostate is for the sake of the ummah. Because right, you're, a threat, to protect, you're, a, yeah. you're protecting the Islamic community for the spreading of the corruption and also the suggestion that this is even a possibility. Yeah. So it's not for your sake, that's for the sake of the other exactly. Muslims. Yeah. Yep. Wow. <laughs> how does it, so, yeah, let's move on. So how does it, now you're you're married, uh, you have several kids um, with your, like the, his, with the, her, your husband, uh, and how does it start unraveling? Does the is it that things start not making sense or is it that something happens with the marriage? What happens? Where? Well, as, yeah. I mean, so we were quite segregated initially, like as I was, uh, when I first converted and got married and we were like isolated in different cities and stuff. And, but as I was having more kids, we moved closer to my family. And then after uh, a time he married a second wife too, and so in being, Canada, yeah, yeah, and it's very common actually. We found out after it happened that there's like lots, so and anyway, yeah, so during that time, um, it's very hard to be segregated in, in uh, among society. And as our kids were getting older, and I have an autistic child, so I had to start bringing him to therapy. We were homeschooling all the kids, but he had to be brought like to therapy. So I would have to go out and now be among society. So the difficulties of that and being like as 
practicing and having to keep like the second family from everybody like and have that second life and kind of like have lie to people about stuff that just started really wearing on me and I didn't it wasn't me like not liking Islam it was more me just it was wearing on me to a point where I didn't know what to do anymore like I felt like I just I had to get out and I I didn't know like I, I just I I just had to get out and I couldn't even explain why and it was like watching my kids grow up and now having to force them to do this thing that I had chosen and I always thought that I would you know the kids would have the freedom to choose as well like because there was the, the no compulsion I thought that our kids would get that chance as well but as they were getting older I was realizing no like it's being enforced on everybody's kids like you just that whole wow. like beat them until they're seven to pray like and then those stupid verses about like you're literally forcing your kids to practice i think that the point that you brought up about um forcing your kids to go through something that you had chosen yeah that's so important because when they talk about the no compulsion thing um, they say, well, you know, you're free to choose. And a lot of people are like, I'm choosing Islam, I'm choosing Islam. Mm -hmm. But then what they do is that, you know, the, the, when they have kids, you know, you f you force it on them and you indoctrinate yeah. them. That's not a choice. No. Yeah, you know, that's not a choice. It's uh, So I, I think what you mentioned there is actually pretty profound in that sense. Like when we talk about whether religion can be a choice and whether indoctrination um, is, is a choice or not. So that, I'm actually really glad that you had that insight that well that was what actually the straw that broke the camel's back that made me like I had been wanting to go for a long time but I understood how hard it would be because I was so like I had kept so many secrets from my own family like I didn't even know where I would go but um it was just when my kids would actually like I saw that in them that they just they didn't want that anymore it was like this weird like because my ex would go back and forth between the two houses and when he was coming to my house like the kids were just like scared like they didn't want him coming anymore and it was that's when i started seeing like okay i gotta get out now mm -hmm. and i i honestly like over these past few years uh as i've gotten out of it i'm only starting to really understand like what it was because i just like Islam wasn't even the thing I was running from. I was just running from the situation. And then after a, a time, like I had taken my hijab off at that time too. I just, I couldn't, like I, I was so messed up. Like going out into public was terrifying me. I was terrified of everybody. Like I thought, like I was so scared of just being a public Why? Muslim. Just that like, like there's like right wing people that were going to try to attack me. It was just this crazy, like anxiety. Like I didn't, I couldn't function or it was just, I was being really irrational with. Did you, did you, did you face any discrimination from maybe, me? Like a little bit, like just people mm. making comments or like looking at me. It was like, there was like a lot of T acts going on. And so people were starting to like, um, look at Muslims, you know, like that. But for me, it was just like the anxiety of everything was just getting me to a, a point. And I took my hijab off and that like was such a relief because I just like blended in now <laughs> to society. Mm. And so that ease helped me to. Um, so as as much as, it, as much as you think that um, anxiety was you, exaggerated like so there is some discrimination but not to the point that would w warrant the amount of anxiety that you felt right? right however does this suggest that a lot of muslims are still other muslims are experiencing i mean even if you think it's unjustified it's still pretty sad that they're experiencing that much anxiety like yeah. is that a common is that something that other Muslims think you're ex like in Canada or United States are experiencing on a daily basis? That I think level so. Of like, mm. I think every time any news comes out, like what's been happening, I think like hijabi women would be a lot more afraid to go out in public. There's been 
Aww. Like I totally, it affected me. Mm. That is sad. What would you, what would you suggest to, for people to uh, non-Muslims to do? Like, is there any, rec- I, but given that you had the experience of being a hijabi yeah, good question. woman, yeah. What would you? I don't know. There's like, I, I don't even know. Hmm. It's just more people just look at you. And I think just the added paranoia, just, I don't know. You know, the, the, the one suggestion would be to be friendly or smile at somebody, but that's also like haram. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know. Yeah, you like, can't, you can't do that with the hijabi. Can't do, we can't do that with the hijabi. You uh, can, sometimes you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but just like being nicer. Just being, ki- being kind, being nice. Yeah. yeah you guys, you can, you can. can I run to the bathroom real quick? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah, sure. yeah. Of course. Of course. I think okay. it's that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. No worries. No worries. That's all good. Um, I do want to um, ask. Okay, so I do want to ask what that's very interesting that the thing that got her like the motherly so my understanding is this your understanding it was the motherly love that basically got her like this is this is, saw that this is toxic to her children that this managed is, to yeah. yeah this is reminding me of remember when we had Tanya Joya on yeah. uh, the she was the uh ex wife of the ISIS leader uh, right, right, right. in Syria. So she had um and she talked about something similar that when her kids were growing up, right. Mm. And she saw that it, what they would have to go through, because you know, kids grow up, you want the best for your kids. You want them to be able to make their own choices and, and so on. And then, right. and then when you, when you realize that that's not happening and, and you made your choice, I think Tanya, we were talking about another guest. We had Tanya joy as she was the uh, ex-wife of an, uh, an ISIS leader. I think that's how you know we're saying it, but, he uh, she had a similar kind of thing i think she had five kids with him and as the kids grew up um there were certain incidents that happened with the kids where you know she thought okay now this is becoming too much um so i you know I, I, it's it seems like that really makes a difference once your kids do start growing up yeah like when you're especially you convert and you're consciously choosing this difficult way of life you know it's difficult like fasting's hard like everything's hard <laughs> and uh to, to enforce it on a child like and like you know how they like make little toddlers like memorize quran and stuff it's just so crazy yeah this, how, how did you you mentioned many times like you know moving closer to your family and then you know you're, you're keeping secrets from your family how did your family respond to all of this i mean i think that they you have the conversion to Islam, and then you go into his career, and then, you know, it, it just feels like it's just getting worse and worse. And then, you know, oh, yeah. you're covering yourself up. You're sort of deeply involved in this cult, and then you have kids, and the kids are going through it. So, I, And then he takes a second wife. Like, how, how did all of this sort of play out with the family? Did they try to intervene? Did they try to reach out to you? They always tried to reach out. They, they were always, like, nice and... Um, they you know they disapproved of a lot of it obviously but i mean mm-hmm. they loved the kids and like um i tried to keep the kids in their life a lot so that was good like i tried to keep close connection although it was very hard to keep the second wife from him and then as the kids got older they had to learn how to lie to my parents saying like you know they don't like it so we're teaching now the children how to lie and that was really you know hard on a kid because like they're their grandparents and you know this is like something that they're part of you know yeah so teaching them like you know it's wrong here in this country but islamically it's right so it's just like so confusing for them and the, it's another question i had was that uh you know majid nawaz obviously he had it so he was your ex-husband's mentor right uh, and then he comes out of jail and he is now a reformer and he yeah. starts thinking yeah. differently. So, you know, uh, did that, w- were you watching this and did that have any kind of influence in you? Like, okay, here's a guy, like, you know, I, I know that he was a guy who helped your husband get into it, but uh, I were you following his trajectory as well in the terms of, yeah. okay, so there is a guy who was in my situation and now he's not, and that's a yeah. something like that. Right. So um, the way my ex talked about it, and it was funny because he was like, 
you know, I really revered Majid and I want to know what he thinks because it might be something that I might believe as well. Like he was actually going into it with like that type of mindset even. Wow. So as he um, discussed with, with him, it was more just like trying to get him back to his, <laughs> if anything. And as he realized that that wasn't happening and then as he was starting the Quilliam Foundation and everything, it like he was just like talking about how much of a deviant and an enemy to Islam he is now because moderating Islam is like one of the worst things you can do. So, yeah, it just became Wait, like a negative. So how did he actually manage to get out, though? Like, isn't the, the control very tight, especially over Hit, the... Like, who imagined? Um, no, no, no. From your husband. Like, is it like, how did you manage to like... Did you just pack up and leave? No. Like, was it as simple no, as that? He, yeah. so, it, um, so I told him I wanted to leave and it was like, but I, I didn't know how to say it. So I was like, I, you know, just like leave me alone for a while and just stay at the other house and let the kids so they don't even notice. That was what I intended initially. Hmm. And when I started expressing that, he, of course, doubled down. It was trying to like, enforce everything on me and as i was like resisting i was like telling him like i know nothing's going to change like so how can i you know there's nothing's going to change and it was just escalating anyway because he had just been traveling to a bunch of countries and they were looking for a place for us all to move to so it was just going to get worse <laughs> and i knew it was headed that way and um so i just so his uh, his other wife uh, got pregnant again, and then he took me aside and told me that I can't leave the house anymore without his permission. Like I was going to wow. now be locked down, and so I was just like shocked with that. So I I thought of an excuse that I could go to my parents with the kids for the weekend, and um, I did that with the intention of not coming back. So I did tell him like on the Sunday night before going back or before having to go back, I told him I'm not coming back. <clears throat> and then it became crazy where he was like threatening uh, to get the kids. And he did take my son out of therapy, like a, like before it took him back, like away from me. And then we ended up having to go to a shelter for a month to get away from him because he was, um, just not letting it happen. So, is there any legal action that you could take? I mean, you, you were in Canada, right? So this is another. Yeah, they. Saudi I Ireland. mean, yeah. he he got like harassment and like stalking charges, and then I got a restraining order for three years, which was what I needed. Mm. But I mean, it protects. Like, I mean, I I got the restraining order, but the kids didn't. So, you know. Um, yeah, okay. that's mm -hmm. Armin. Go ahead. So, uh, he, okay, so after you left all of that, you're you're still a Muslim though. When you left, yeah, like and you were okay. So how did you you left uh, your husband? You left Hezbo Tahrir. You're still a Muslim. Yeah. What um, hap What happened then? I didn't know what to do. I I didn't leave Islam. I, that wasn't even a thing I was thinking. But I did take my hijab off, and I I just started like just living. I, I didn't practice at all. So I was just in my mind, I'm like, I'm just not practicing right now. And the lawyers and everybody would ask me like, are you Muslim still? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I didn't know what to think until like my ex accused me in the court papers saying I had publicly denounced Islam. Like he literally put that in there. And I was like, what? Like, I never did that. <laughs> but, and then, so it just kind of like led me to be like, well, yeah, I guess. Yep, I guess now I'll probably <laughs> denounce Islam then. So Wait, that's what I. Be... Okay, you know, go on. Sorry. Yeah, that's so. Then I really started like, yeah. just decided to just shed it all and and really think about the religion and it um, it just led me on the path to. Um, Okay, but why would that be in the court document? Like I don't know. He, he you should see he writes novels <laughs> statements. Okay, but like but like is was it, like what is he thinking? Like the judge is gonna be I like, know, 
right? I was, oh my God, I wasn't on your side until you told me that she left the announcement. I mean, you're in Canada. Like, what? Yeah, how, no, how but he's that? not delusional. <laughs> like, to him, that's like an important thing to state in the, like, in the Canadian court. Yeah. Or and then I was just like, and I told my lawyer, I'm like, do you know, like, what he believes about that? Like, he actually mm. believes, like, about apostasy and all that stuff like why like, would you put that in so wait there? did you say renounce or denounce 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 so you insulted islam in a way it's it this is this is reminding me again of um yasmin muhammad's story i mean yasmin was actually abused by her parents and she sought legal action and the judge sent her back home because it's their culture That's so right crazy. so if Maybe you it was like that kind of thing like he was yeah, if it is, I mean, that's a very, very problematic thing. Um, you know, the, these these kinds. Of, I mean, I, I I just think that if you did you tell uh, the courts that he had taken a second wife and yeah, I told everyone right from the start. Like like nobody can do anything because he wasn't legally married to two people. So uh, he yes, yeah, so he's not legally married, but I mean, just when you have all of those things and and you have kids who are being raised in that environment, it's just. Uh, I mean, this is probably another an entire topic for another episode where, you know, how the legal system, they would never allow that to happen for a white family, a Canadian family. It's just, well, that's what it's, I'm saying. Even the Mormons get, like, in trouble, don't they? Like, here mm -hmm. in Canada? Wait, she is a half-white family. Sorry? What do you mean? By, you mean, like, Canadian family? No, a family? Canadian... Like Deborah is Canadian and she was white. No, yeah, but yeah, she was... Though. But like, I, I'm talking about the ex-husband and the kids, right? Like, if you have a Canadian white family versus a Canadian Muslim family, right? Or Muslim non-white family, then you have, it, if it's like somebody who's been born raised here and you have this kind of stuff happening in the household, like Child Protective Services would be like, this is an abusive environment. This is terrible. Uh, you know, th th there's some cultish behavior going on. We need to take some, like, they may not take child custody away, but they're going to, there's going to be something. Um, I know. I mean, I have it's like, like the bigotry of low expectations child, here. Just... Child Protective Services had been involved right from when I was in a shelter, and they knew all this. And it's like nobody could do anything. And he literally, I think he took them to court. I think my ex like even tried to take the Child Protective Services to court, and they started backing off because of it. There, this is a real. So this is a real problem. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example that's somewhat. It's related, but it's a little different. Is uh, I have uh, you know these these friends, and they have a son who's about like ten years old or something, and he goes to school, and he's half Arab, right? So he's half Arab, like half white, and he's got the very sort of white complexion. He's not very very brown, and he was going to school, and there were a lot of kids of sort of Syrian immigrants, the so Syrian refugees who've come to Canada. And they were bullying him because he wasn't really a full Arab. They're like, you know, why don't you know Arabic? Why do you speak Arabic with an accent? Why are you so yeah. light skinned, even though you're an Arab? Um, and uh, they, he, they reported it. The parents reported it many times, but they couldn't do anything. The kids of Syrian refugees, they wouldn't do anything. Wow. Right? And they had to move to a different school. I mean, this is something. I mean, it just this just happened like a few months ago. That's so crazy. I know. About there's something seriously wrong with the system over here. And, and you know, people like you, you are suffering for it and your kids are suffering for it. Yeah. Well. Um, uh, Ali, we need to go to patron questions. If we have extra time, we could then ask more questions, but I don't want to like rush yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, so Suzanne we, like, just asked the about questions. the triple teluk. So he, he teluked me over text <laughs> after I left. Wait. So okay, so let's read. Let's read Susanna's question. Yeah. Susanna saying, has her ex husband. Oh, sorry. You want me to read it? Or? Go on. As her ex husband triple talaked her. So talak means divorce, and you're the way that you divorce in Islam is you can just say, well, at least in Sunni Islam is you can just say, I divorce you. I divorce you. I divorce you. You triple talak, and that means you're divorced. Uh, the mm -hmm. guy can do that, and it's done. Uh, so she's saying, has your your ex husband triple talaked you, or is are you still technically married to him under Islamic law? I don't know. I think we probably are technically still married because he like divorced me over text, but he didn't even say Taluk three times. He just hmm. said, fine, I'll divorce you. 
and that was it. Was Wait, like, okay. so he doesn't even know how to t divorce you? Well, that's what I'm food? saying. Like his his superiors in the Hizzab probably would disapprove and be like, um, you need to properly do this. <laughs> yeah, he yeah, doesn't I even mean, know the Islamic way. Everybody knows the triple. Oh, he knows, but I guess something, something right, you know. <laughs> okay, so let's go through the questions from the yeah. top. Uh, Katie we, is asking. She's saying, "Why is Deb such a sweet person?" And as a Muslim, did you did she believe that certain groups of people should be killed? So I think we covered that um, as well. Yeah. But I didn't like the so idea sweet? of it, but I had to believe it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, how did you? But uh, just a sweet person. She's saying, "Why are you such?" And I agree with her. You're a very sweet person. But how, how do you have your having been through all this? How did you kind of regain your sanity how did you that's still a process actually <laughs> <laughs> don't think i have regained it all um there's still well, a lot of spite and and rage in there but i'm trying yeah. to harness it and direct it in a proper manner well i think that that's probably one of the things i mean to me it seems you're very articulate and i like what you're telling stories well uh stana saying for deborah what do you think of islam versus islamism and people try to create a distinction between Islam and political Islam. So as uh, an ex hizbi uh, like as Munira, what I used to be called, um, I would say there is no difference. But um, now I do see that there is like, I, I don't know, I'm still caught between like, can we say there is just a religious Islam and this ideological? I don't know. I, it's like as soon as you start digging deep into Islam, you end up with political Islam or the right, ideology right. because it's just they just follow the pure text, so it's like all there. So like, I think create anything out of it, like the, w the way you can separate it is like when it comes to the Islam itself, there is no difference between Islam and political Islam because if you read Islam, uh, hadith of the Quran, you can see that in Muhammad's way, you can yep. see that it's completely political. But I think you could separate Muslims, you know, oh. political Muslims and non political yep. Muslims. But Big again, if but yeah, so I think that separation should be between Muslims, not Islam itself. That's what I think. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like all the the sweet Muslims that I know and knew before, um, they were just like the loveliest people. They are the loveliest people, and they just pray at home and do their thing and fast in Ramadan. And no, they're not trying to enforce anything. They just love it, and it's just they're charitable and. But like when we would take these lovely, nice Muslims as hisbis and be like, look, this is the religion, they would fall into it. They'd be like, right. they agree. And they, you know, as soon as we meet Muslims that decided to, I'm going to really learn the religion, they ended up coming to the hizb and being like, yeah, you guys are the right ones. Like, so, you know, so I saw that process with... Right just the religious Muslims, so. we need to do a little bit shorter answers for questions if we to make sure we get to all of them uh okay. so you, you do the next question Ali? katie is saying uh how come hizbut tahrir has been banned in several islamic countries like egypt pakistan and almost all arab countries easy easy answer well yeah because their method is to stage a coup a political coup in an Islamic country. So their method is once they're there, they get an army to agree with them, they will overturn the government. So there it's a big threat. Uh, yes. the Here, they're just trying to spread ideas and they want everyone to go back to the Muslim countries and do that. Um, so I mean, that's why. I mean, it's, if your entire ideology is to replace the current governments with an, with a, with a new caliphate, global caliphate. I mean, if you're the government of these Islamic countries, I'm pretty sure you're not going to see. You're not going to like an ideology that is that the entire purpose is to replace a government with something else, right? So yeah. obviously they're not going to like it. Um, next one. Jim King is saying, was the attraction to Hizab more from the attraction to the guy and it came alone or because uh, you were into the black and white thinking and liked feeling that this is the real truth. 
it was both um i mean he was very like everything about it like um was very compelling the fact like again like he was it was just more i don't know the char the charisma of it like they're very charismatic and they're taught to be charismatic so yeah uh and uh, jim's also saying what would uh, what would your reaction be no, what would have her reaction while she was all in? What her re what would your reaction have been if you had come across an Armin type who says it's all BS versus a softer reformer type? So, you know, you've got the choice between Armin, who's like firebrand. He's like, nope, leave it all, dump it all, you know, deterred in a swimming pool. You still wouldn't jump in, you know, that kind of thing. And then versus that, you've got a reformer type who's giving you sort of Islam light. So as a Muslim coming across Armin? Mm. Yeah. When no, like, yeah, if you, as a Muslim, as a Hezbollah Tahrir Muslim, um, but when you were all in, right. what would you, let's see, I, I come to you, my reaction, like, all to of, you. my reaction to me compared to my, to your reaction to somebody who wants to change Islam, but it's still like not anti-Islam, but want to reform Islam. That's what I think. Is. Yeah, interesting. I, I would see both as bad, like mm -hmm. not like, you know, it is very black and white. So even like the mo like, teaching, like what Madge's doing was almost worse because you're trying to change the religion. And that's like, so worse, uh, worse. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. How does that play with the his, I mean, you said that your husband was at least, uh, ex-husband was at least curious about it, but that Majid Nawaz, when he came out, I mean, he's been there, his rhetoric about you know reforming and all that uh, how how do you think uh, that plays with it does is is there any advantage to that in uh, for people in his career would they find that message compelling at all what magic do doing yeah you want to get back to highlighting because ali okay. never lets me highlight something i want to highlight but go on but I answer ali has, before we get back to that he has probably influenced more his uh to him but i'm not sure like again like it depends if, if they were like my ex like he right away sees like how bad it is and he's be corrupted and all that yeah right can i get back to the how worst thing is so to the people who say that armin baby steps baby steps okay this is like every time i don't know why is it that every time we get like an answer it's always like proves me right because i don't even <laughs> i don't even claim to be like i don't even claim that this is what what i'm saying works 100 percent of the time right i'm just claiming that it works m more often but every time we get an answer from our guests it just seems to be like proving me right okay so for the people that say armin we have to ease it in we have to ease it in like what you're doing is too aggressive okay what you're doing is too aggressive and i'm like no it's not Cha like the reform thing is not seen as a baby step that people could be more accepting of compared to what i'm doing the reform thing is even more aggressively against these fundamentals they hate them even more it's not a baby step it's not a baby step so this easing into them this is like a less hostile it's not a less this is like more problematic to them to more to a lot of them than what i'm t telling them okay so mm -hmm. this whole don't let people argue that this reform thing might work better because it's easing people into something that they will find more acceptable. however Oh. The this process that Magic is doing, I think, is necessary to show mm. that it's not possible. I Ooh. think it has to try because right. honestly, like, because mm. when you see that you can't change it, right. you have, to, like, I think you have to try. I love it. I, think I, you have love, to show I, I love it. I love it. So the only reason why we should try reforming Islam is to show, to show how it miserably work. it fails. <laughs> Just to show how because how, it will fail. How big like, of a failure you can't it is. Okay. It. Like I don't think it's possible. I will sign off to that. The only reason why we should try to reform Islam is to show how big of a failure reforming Islam could be. That's great. I love that. Yeah, I bro, you you've made Armin very happy today. <laughs> that's, like, that's quite an epiphany. So, <laughs> okay. uh, did. Uh, uh, Debra ever go through a reformist phase like Majid, where she was considered a deviant by her community, but was still a practicing Muslim? No, that was like after right after I left and took hijab off. That would have been me, the deviant. 
Yeah. I yeah. was being called corrupt and deviant. Yeah. But were you still there belief wise at that point? Yeah. I, I, again, I was, I had kind of like given myself a pass to just not think about it for a bit. Cause I was just going through so much other stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. And then uh, John is saying, how was Deborah brought into Islam after becoming atheist? Yeah. Well, so I, what happened there? Yeah. So um, I wasn't like a full atheist. I had just like left Christianity because that was the only religion I knew, actually. So I was very still open to spirituality. And I and I had made the conscious effort to study other religions. Like I wanted to study Hinduism and Buddhism and all those things, too. Um, I had just come across a Muslim first, and that's the one I ended up, mm. you know, diving headfirst into at that time. Yeah, so I think, yeah, we have about five minutes left, but this is, I mean, this is fascinating. Jim is uh, asking, so similar question, but from your husband's point of view, uh, ex-husband's point of view, does Deborah's husband or ex-husband feel more ill will toward a Majid type who he would oh. say practices a deviant form of we Islam? Yeah, you already answered, or Armin. So it's clearly the Majid type. Yeah, I, okay. I actually think so, yeah. Yeah, so we have a question by John that is in three. Guys, put your questions into one so I could highlight them. But this is like, I don't even know what the question is. John is saying nominal Muslim versus devout Muslims. So no nominal or cultural Muslims rejected literal or political Islam in ex in your experience, Deborah, I don't know what the question is. You I, I don't know what this is either. So this is, okay. Uh, so maybe John, if you can ask it in a different way. Um, yeah. Okay. okay so Bobo Bobo is asking, uh, how do you recommend speaking to an Islamist and challenging their ideas? Any tips you have to change their mind? Wow. Um. Oh. I don't even know. I haven't tried yet. <laughs> what is it when you were sort of deeply mired into in this and supposing you had some issues with it, you were feeling trapped, you know, your kids and you're like, I don't like the way this is going. What do you think someone may have been able to say to you that would have made you think, okay, you know what? It's okay for me to get out of this or the people that you know in the atheist community, the ex-Muslim community, what, which, I mean, you can even take, sort of name which doing, one no them. doing what i'm doing right now like be exposing myself that i got out and i'm doing because getting out and, and the prospect of trying to leave my situation it it was years of me like fighting that and I, because i knew how it, was, it would be like this hell that i'm going through i knew it would be that hard mm. because i was so entrenched in it so I think it's just a matter of be, being as vocal and apparent to other people. Like if I had seen, if I had seen more people that were that <clears throat> entrenched it, get out and just do it anyways, and have like a community. I didn't know about ex-Muslims. I think it would have been easier if I had seen that. Mm -hmm. I think it's. Um, I think this kind of stuff is is very important and. Um, even in my community, I, I try to make sure that all the wrong people even see these videos. Like I want them to even like, I get like some hate messages saying, oh, you talked about me or whatever. <laughs> and I'll be like, I don't care because I hope that that gives you that seed in you that when you want to get out, that you'll get out like too, or yeah, that yeah. you know you can. I think people I like your husband actually tend to, they, they do watch this and they're really engaging. Right now, a lot of the time. fundamentalists are engaging a lot with ex-Muslims, like really yeah. big time because- It shows that we're a threat. That's what it shows. That's good. Yeah, or just that it's an option because- it's an option. Yeah. 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 You're very um, segregated. Like it's such a cult. Okay, so yeah. there's a question. I think this one is for me. I'm going to answer it in half a, half a minute. Alex is saying you can have some doing it aggressively and some doing it in stages. No. Yes, Alex, but you could do it aggressively in stages, but with the right methodology. Okay, so the reform is not stages. Or it's not aggressive. It's both, the reform thing is both aggressively in stages the wrong way or the going at the anti-Islam way. You could do the anti-Islam way in stages or aggressively. So it's not like the reform is stages and the anti-Islam is aggressive. No, you could do the anti-Islam method, which is the right method in stages or aggressively. And you could do the reform way, which is wrong, 
whether you do it in stages or aggressively. I do want to just highlight not a, mo not a question anymore like, because we only have 20 seconds. Just a, a comment by Jim King saying, I love how honest and genuine Deborah is. Uh, still so sweet after going through such a rough thing. Absolutely agree. Absolutely. And Deborah, thank you for joining us. This was fantastic. And fantastic. hope to talk to you more and stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Bye, everyone. Love you guys in the live chat. Love you, Deborah. Thank you. Love you. <laughs>